Welcome to the North Shore Fellowship Podcast, a place to explore the intersection of God's story and our lives. Welcome back. This is Chris. I'm sitting here with Heather and Jason. Jason, what are we going to talk about today? Well, we're going to build on last week's discussion of our membership vows. Another thing that happens in new members class is we talk about what kind of church North Shore is. This is a question we get all the time, and it's such a it's such a big question that sometimes it really is hard yeah. to answer. It's hard to sort of nail down and say this and nothing else is what North Shore is. Partly because the body of Christ itself is so diverse uh, that to do justice to what the church is is. Um, is really to spend a lot of time talking about all the different gifts that are present in the church, all the different missions that each individual member might engage in in his or her life. So um, I thought I'd I'd take a stab a little bit today with you all. We could discuss uh, some of the strands within our denomination um, and that would spill out to other denominations as well, but we'll talk about it just within our particular context and then where we see ourselves as a church within all that. I think that might be interesting for us. And we do discuss this a little bit in new members. And we also take up this topic in in places like officer training when we're trying to figure out, like, how do we relate to the rest of our denomination and what kind of church are we? Those kinds of questions. So uh, uh, labels can be constraining, but I don't think they're always constraining. I think sometimes they can be revealing and helpful. So. Yeah, and, and I know where you're going with this, but just yesterday I was in the hallway with a, a member of our church, and he was saying he's been in three different churches, all within our denomination, the PCA, and he's just realizing that there's a lot of different kind of churches in the PCA, because he's, he's sort of landed in three churches that were very similar, maybe in these strands kind of way. So it, it is relevant to realize that there is a uh, a bit of diversity in the body, and, and probably for the good. Yeah. So, so, so uh, you're going to attempt to label some of these di- differences. Is that correct? Is that what you're saying by strands? Can yeah. you give me like a word? Is there a picture for that? How about we use the picture of three currents within one stream? If you've ever been down the Hiawassee or the Ocoee rivers, you've tried to you know navigate your way down. You'll find that some places are a little faster. Some places there's more of a swirl going on. So there's you're in the same stream, you're in the same creek or river, but there's there's not just the same thing happening at every particular moment. So um, I think uh, think church uh, wider church culture can be like that. There can be different streams within one denomination or even within the same church. And as we do this, obviously, this is an oversimplification. You know, once we start putting labels on anything, you know that they don't always fit, and there's exceptions, and you can be. You could be going down the same stream and uh, caught in two different currents at the same time. So Maybe if, all three. If you're really anti-label, you can just catch us next week. Just go ahead and turn the podcast off for no, this week. Oh, don't say that. Don't say that. But can when you are describing these, can they be things that I myself would tend towards? Do you understand Absolutely. what I'm asking? Absolutely. Sure. Um, so... Th- you know, one one way to look at it is that different people have favorite Bible verses, for example, or different people have theologians or books or songs even that that really resonate with them. That's different from what that resonates with their neighbor. And so, I might offer a recommendation to you that just doesn't really meet you where you're at, doesn't really speak to your story or your particular problems or concerns. But there's a richness within Scripture that many different people will find their place within that story and within the words of Scripture. Uh, they'll find a mission that really resonates with them based on what's in the story. And, you know, far be it for me to, to constrain how you apply what you learn in scripture. I can tell you where the boundaries are. I can tell you what's off limits, but, um, I'm not uh, going to be telling you, you know, what you do at five o'clock today. Once you clock out, Heather. Glad to hear that, Jason. So we're not going to be reinventing the wheel. This is a discussion that's gone on in, our denomination and in various parts of, of Reformed Christianity uh, for decades. And so um, we're actually building on things that other people have observed, just kind of distilling that. So let's talk about these, these three currents, these three strands within our denomination and the broader Reform movement. Uh, the doctrinalist, the transformationalist, and the pietist. 
Um, those are big words, so we need to just take a few minutes and unpack them. Chris, what is a doctrinalist? <laughs> well, first I'm thinking, Heather just asked, am I going to be one of these or some of these? And those sound like heavy church jargony words that most of our people are probably now thinking, well, I'm none of those. Don't turn it off. You might be. Uh, but okay, to answer the question now. So a, a doctrinalist is someone that has a, a lot of interest in knowing, uh, in Christian uh, orthodoxy, in reading the Bible properly, in conducting worship in the right way. Uh, so there's a there's a heavy emphasis on, sometimes they'll call it the objective ordinances like baptism and catechism. And somebody with a heavy doc, doctrinalist bent is going to expect those uh, ordinances and the preaching of the word to do most of the heavy lifting where the work of the church happens in a worship service according to these standards that are clearly laid out in Scripture. So, and I think we should say at the outset here that each of these streams is going to have strengths and weaknesses. I, Absolutely. I, I think that's that's pretty important to point out. So, obviously, we, we all want to be care, uh, careful to um, observe doctrine and observe boundaries and you know, use, use wisdom from scripture when it comes to building a worship service or, or asking the question, what do we believe? Um, there are also some weaknesses that can come from each of these. So for, for this particular strand, one of the weaknesses that we see from time to time is that, um, the, the brain on a stick model of, uh, human anthropology, uh, that if you just think the right things, you'll be the right kind of person. Um, boiling, uh, boiling, spirituality down to, you know, knowing systematic theology, for example. Okay, so the strengths in a doctrinalist uh, current would be that the things are taught like justification, sanctification, catechism. There's a lot of knowledge. Is that correct? Yeah, there's a, a lot of knowledge and there's also clarity on boundaries. There's... Um, in a, in a world where um, people uh, sometimes prefer confusion or the gray versus black and white, I think doctrinalists are very v inclined towards bringing clarity and boundaries. And that can be a, a very beautiful and helpful thing for people. And, and they have done so in very helpful ways. Uh, one of those ways is just writing down in our Westminster standards uh, clear definitions of justification, sanctification, glorification. We can go back to them again and again. And it's it's true, and it, it it actually holds us together in some good ways. I grew up in a church that uh, said doctrine is divisive, uh, but we we definitely believe that these these doctrinal doctrinal truths <laughs> uh, hold us together in some important ways. And it's true that doctrine is divisive, but what you're doing is recognizing divisions that are already there. On the negative side, you can focus on doctrine and minutia within doctrine to an extent that produces further division that's really unhealthy and unhelpful. So uh, that does happen as well. So again, strengths and weaknesses. Is there a theologian that you would say would be a good example of a doctrinist? Most theologians, I think, would be examples of doctrinalists. Uh, R.C. Sproul would come to mind as someone who typically fits you know, kind of within the tradition in this way. So Jason, then uh, the second one's a pietist. What does that mean? So when we use the word piety, typically we're talking about the the practice of religion, particularly the internal practice of religion, personal spirituality. Uh, someone in this camp would emphasize the relationship with God, uh, feeling the right things, you know, having the right uh, personal practices of of devotions, reading scripture, prayer, uh, and the like. And I would fit with that an an emphasis on evangelism, a conversion experience. Oftentimes, yes. Uh, maybe powerful uh, prayers. Sometimes missions gets put into here, and that might be a little bit of an overreach. Uh, particular types of missions, in particular, where you're, you know, you're emphasizing, you know, participating in the Great Commission and evangelism. So the Pietists are very often in our circles a reaction to doctrinalism and and teaching, right? So that. You know, it's a pushback against the, the the brain on a stick model, where you're like, "Hey, there's a there's a heart here that needs to be tended to and cared for." 
um, and from which should should be flowing the the energy and vitality for a Christian life. So a pietist cares about evangelism, and one of the things they are concerned about when they hear a doctrinalist talking is that there's not as much enthusiasm about conveying the gospel, getting new people to believe the gospel, conversions in particular, being born again. And so um, that leads the pietist to, in some ways, uh, focus on results a little bit more. They've been accused of being uh, pragmatist, whatever works, you know, and, and if a doctrine gets in the way of what works, maybe it's time to toss that doctrine to the side for a minute. And so um, it, the pietist and the doctrinalist have those things against each other. Yeah, there can also be um, the accusation that uh, a pietist is concerned with personal spirituality and less concerned with what's going on in the broader world, uh, corporately and socially. Um, obviously, it's very uh, uh, in, in in American history, for example, there were a lot of strands of of Christianity that focused on on personal piety, uh, but didn't care if you owned slaves, for example. So within our world, there there have been some moments and some some little pockets of revival, and very often that's driven by people who are pietists, who care uh, deeply about how people feel and connect to the Lord. So uh, that's one of the positives that we sometimes see from this is, um, you know, someone like Jack Miller uh, and uh, uh, Sonship in the one of our sister denominations. Uh, as a real movement uh, to recover, I think piety would be a good uh, encapsulation of this. And a lot of good things happen from that. So I heard you mention a brain on a stick, and then you mentioned our hearts. So if I'm going to really simplify what we've said up to this point, a doctrinalist would be a head, a pietist would be a heart, and we have a third one, the transformationalist, which in some ways is the hands. Yeah, that's a that's a significant simplification, but it's not entirely wrong. Yeah, many transformationalists are in fact quite heady. Uh, they're they're people who are interested in changing the world, and very often in our world, uh, Presbyterians being the nerds that they are, that uh, starts with understanding the world. So trying to get a grip on you know what are the structures of the world, you know what 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 what's shaping the world and you know how is it being formed worldview questions t- tend to come into play in this category as well so um ideally it would be hands but uh, sometimes it's uh it's it's more just heads thinking about what to do with your hands yeah so i think i think about hands because your your head and your heart are kind of within yourself and when we think about the difference that our faith should make there needs to be something that sort of acts, something that changes, something that's different, that does something. Um, and but you're right the 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 intellectual side of the transformationalist movement is is seems to be enamored with uh, modern scholarship and attaches itself easy to uh, new ideas that are good for society. Um, what are some of the things that a transformationalist cares about? Yeah, so so I think one of the ways to see this is to look at at different points in church history where people have gotten concerned about transforming the culture, um, and very often this is on the heels of revival for, through Pietists or um, uh, on on the other side of of establishing doctrinal uh, truths in the British evangelical movement in the 18th century, beginning of the 19th century, uh, after uh, the Great Awakening, which was very, uh, very pietistic, uh, and uh, the doctrinal uh, recovery of, of, you know, truths from the Reformation, from people like uh, Newton, who wrote Amazing Grace. What we wind up with is, is people looking around at society and thinking, wow, there's a lot of problems here. There's a massive amount of gin being consumed in Britain. Uh, there's slavery and there's abuse of animals. And, and so uh, there was a, a real uh, thrust uh, towards transforming the culture uh, through, through political movements, uh, as well as um, you know, groups that, that studied and tried to get active and, and influence people and how they lived and practiced. And that did produce uh, the demise of slavery in the British Empire. Uh, really remarkable uh, turn of events. Um, other points for transformation happen in different ways at, at different times, but that's a good example of, of transformationalism in action. 
Okay, so you've given us a good history with these three currents. What does that mean for us here at North Shore? Obviously, everything that we just said about British evangelicals, that's long before our denomination was around. And there are other streams that we get uh, our influence, particularly from uh, Calvin's heirs, uh, particularly in the Netherlands, Abraham Kuyper, uh, Herman Bavink, who was one generation or half generation after Kuyper. Those are really influential for people in our world. Um, so you can see some connections and streams with like Covenant College's motto, you know, Christ preeminent over all. That includes all spheres, all things. That includes how you do law or politics, how you do the arts, how you should run your business and how you should care about uh, God's world. So uh, we've picked up those strands, you know, in different ways in our denomination. And transformationalism is today associated pe- with people like Tim Keller, who are, you know, about being in a city, not least so that you can impact people's lives and those people impact the culture. And then you have some, some influence that way on what happens in your country. What are some weaknesses of transformationalists? So some, some people would point out that uh, because people who are transformationalists are interested in transforming or shaping culture, it can quickly move away from spiritual stuff or doctrinal stuff for the sake of that mission. Uh, And uh, you do see this sometimes when uh, denominations are moving away from doctrine or moving away from piety, they're caring more and more just about cultural transformation um, or a particular political agenda. And um, denominations or even just individual churches can get so wrapped up in the way they want to transform things that they start to lose their uh, doctrinal and and pietistic connections. So it seems to me like any denomination would need to have all three of these in order to be healthy. Would you say that? Yeah, and I think probably it's fair to say that every church has some of these three, right? Even if you're, um, you consider yourself to be anti-doctrinalist, uh, you're still going to have ideas uh, that control what you believe and uh, you want to uh, impress upon other people. Even very liberal churches that don't seem to have a lot of doctrine have particular ideas that they're committed to. But yeah, I think when it comes down to it, it's a good thing that all three of these strands are present in the PCA. And I think that's very much by design. So, um, Joe Novenson, who was pastor at Lookout Mountain Prez and helped start North Shore Fellowship, really put that into the DNA of North Shore. That's uh, that, that DNA comes from Lookout Prez and from certain strands within our denomination uh, where all three of those are present. We really value all three of those. We do care about doctrine. We care about piety. And we really do care about transformationalism. So if I'm coming to North Shore and I'm coming from a church that really camped out in one of these currents, it was either really doctrinalist or really transformationalist, what difference am I going to see at North Shore? Well, you might have people around you who aren't quite enculturated the way that you are. Uh, That's one of the things that you'll encounter here, I think, is people who from various backgrounds and with various strands and the way that they, even if they don't know these words uh, or wouldn't necessarily relate to them, they've been influenced by this um, at other churches or maybe a campus ministry they were part of. So that is something to keep in mind. People have different backgrounds and will have different ways of relating uh, to these. And I would say that's one of our strengths. I love that about North Shore. I love that people have come from different backgrounds and they teach me a lot about looking at things in a different way. It is definitely not a negative that people are coming in from from different places and perspectives, for sure. Um, another thing to be prepared for is that even if, for example, you're you're a transformationalist, um, not all transformationalists are alike. So you have Tim Keller, who has you know a particular model for how he approaches things, but uh, in um, influenced by people like Francis Schaeffer, uh, very uh, evangelistic in the way that they went about uh, engagement. Um, and, and transforming, um, connecting to the arts, connecting um, to God's truth in every sphere. You also have transformationalists in, in our country and in our denomination that are much more focused on, on the brand of transformation they, they want to see. So 
one famous name is D. James Kennedy, who was a pastor for many years down in Florida, uh, who was very into transformationalism and, and largely along political lines. He believed very much in, you know, praying for and exhorting people to um, not necessarily vote a particular way, but um, put their faith to use in the political sphere. There are other people who are transformationalists who are a little bit less focused on the political sphere, maybe more focused on worldview more generally or uh, on their particular area, which might be uh, the arts influencing culture that way. Another important difference in different strands of transformationalism would be um, transformationalists who want to see the church as a whole as the the primary agent. So uh, this would be uh, a denomination that focuses on lots of um, political statements, lots of uh, lots of rulings and and letters on uh, popular topics, versus a more individual, uh, distributed approach to transforming the culture. Right. So you can you can focus on what we do together as a church body, or you could emphasize that each one of us has our particular callings and roles to play in whatever sphere God has put us in. And, and so um, that's another way that you get a little bit of variety within transformationalism. So some people are very focused on let's get together and all of us are going to transform the world in this particular way, uh, whereas others are a little bit more, whereas another approach would be for individuals to be focused on their particular callings. So are there, is there that much variety with doctrinalists also? There's a lot of variety with doctrinalists. You have different approaches to things like eschatology and the end times, and some people f- care very much about their particular uh, strand of that, and so much so that people start new seminaries or new churches based on that, um, and that would extend to many other areas of doctrine as well. Um, p- the way in which people answer one particular set of questions or the priority they give to one doctrine over and against another can make a huge difference in how these things uh, get spelled out. So we've seen new denominations start uh, there uh, over, over the question of doctrine and even minute pieces of doctrine. So there's a lot of variety there too. And there's some that we consider just so essential, like the inerrancy of scripture and what we call a reformed soteriology that are, are so core to us that uh, such a central doctrine that uh, that would cause us to start asking questions about a split as well. So there's there's kind of like grades of um, seriousness or strictness in terms of the doctrinalist, where issues uh, that we would consider less central, things like recreation on the Sabbath or um, particular kinds of uh, pedagogical teaching images of Jesus and things like that, that we consider less central. Um, there's some variation in that in the within the PCA that's allowable. Even with that variety, it is helpful just as a general framework, you know, it's just a reference point. This is a way of talking about how people within the same stream may be affected more or less by different currents. So we're, we're talking about those that tend to be a little more heady, those that tend to lead more with the heart or feel like a, an experience of the heart is super important, and those that feel like you have to get out and do something about your faith or else it's nothing. So, Heather, which one of those are we here at North Shore Fellowship? Well, I would say we're a good combination of all three. I feel like I've learned all three being here. I can think of examples of where I see all three, either in the sermons or in our teaching or in conversations that I have with other people. Um, I don't know if everybody would feel that way. (laughs) Yeah, so I can I can say just this week I've had conversations with people that would really fit in all three camps, right? What uh, what people are doing with the arts and in the culture, uh, how someone is running their business in a Christian way, and what that means uh, for for him. Uh, and then um, I'm I'll be uh, visiting a, a young couple with a baby here shortly, and one of the things we'll talk about is how do you raise up a child and you know, in, in the nurture and admonition of the Lord, which is a very I think pietistic question. Uh, so. Uh, in a given week, I, I feel like we're, we're doing all three of these things at some level, uh, and we care about all three of these things. I don't think that that means we do it well, necessarily. I think there's certainly room to grow for all of us in, in these three areas and room for us as a church to, uh, to grow in maturity. But um, yeah, I think that's a fair way to put it, that we're, 
we're trying to be faithful to all three of these. And I would say we inherited that from our denomination, which intentionally was designed to be able to contain all of this. Uh, and uh, we inherited it from our, our mother church, Lookout Pres, uh, and uh, the, the strand of Presbyterianism that Lookout represents. How do you help people that don't feel that we have all three? Or do you ever have somebody come to you all and say, hey, we're just really lacking in doctrine, for example. And how do you help people work through that? Or how do they help you all see, hey, I can see where we're missing something and we need to uh, do something about that? That's a really great question. From a transformationalist perspective, we're a little bit more committed to people having their individual missions, people connecting with a, a mission agency or a vocation or even a hobby where they're fruitful for the Lord and uh, the way that they go about serving the community, the way that they go about transforming one pocket of that community or having an impact on others. So uh, some people want us to be more directive than we, than we are or than we feel that we should be. That's one thing, uh, one point of difference. Um, a, another, uh, another thing that we can, we can always acknowledge, though, is that we certainly need to grow uh, in all three of these areas. And that starts at the top and goes all the way down. I don't think anyone has ever fully transformed the world as much as Jesus has called us to. I don't feel like anyone has ever arrived in a pietistic sense at the, the depths of uh, emotion that, that God has for us to connect with him and his word. Um, certainly we need to grow in, in areas of evangelism this morning in our prayer time. I prayed that God would raise up evangelists, uh, in our body. That's something that I pray on a regular basis. And then doctrinally, um, Presbyterians tend to be, uh, we tend to, we tend to grade out pretty well on this, or at least we think we do. Um, but there's also always the responsibility to be passing this along and to, to remain anchored in the truth. So I don't think that we're ever done with this. And so when someone comes to me and says, hey, I think the church needs to work on, and then they fill in that blank, almost always I'll be agreeing with them uh, at some level. And that brings me back to new members and makes me think how exciting it is when God does bring new members into our church who will have... Um, an excitement or a passion or bent towards doctrine or towards transformation. And that will influence our church and help us all grow together. That is so true, Heather. It's incredibly, uh, we see it as a gift to our body when we have new members and they come in with different gifts and interests. And it it takes a little while for a new member in this church to realize that we we really care about their use of their gifts in their areas of life. You know, sometimes they'll, one of the ways it comes up is they'll, they'll ask us, you know, why does North Shore Fellowship not have a, a food truck or a, a particular uh, clothing ministry or something like that? And our answer for over a decade has been, that sounds like an amazing idea. How can we pray for you and join you up with other people and maybe financially contribute to make that happen but that is something that God has given you. That's a passion he's given you. He's given you gifts in that way. So we always want to see people run with the things that God has laid on their hearts. And that goes to our partnerships as well. Like we we don't need to start a ministry from scratch. If other people in town are already doing really good ministry, we can get behind them and partner with them. So that's true for individuals within our church. It's true for organizations around the city. It's better for us to, uh, to partner and to encourage people to get involved in other things that are going on. They don't have to do that just within the walls of North Shore. We love it when people connect uh, more broadly as well. One other thing I hear from new members and other people getting used to our culture is that uh, if they're coming from a doctrinalist background and they're expecting a little more uh, Westminster and particular systematic theology and and the terms that go with it. You know, we don't even, we don't even say justification and sanctification all that much, but we define them all the time uh, in simple terms. Those things are really important to us. We we live under those standards. We're accountable to those standards. 
And in a lot of cases, we actually memorize parts of these standards ourselves. We just don't front load them for our people. So, right. We're not necessarily front loading these things. We're not using these terms, but we are doing all three of these things uh, all the time. So one example of this would be in our our series on First Kings. You're going to hear us talk about Solomon as a transformationalist. I didn't use that term uh, when I preached on First Kings 3 and 4, but we talked about how his mission was to be transformative in the culture and to engage with wisdom and science and and statecraft, uh, government, uh, and extend justice to the least and the lowest uh, in his community. And God was at work in him, helping him be what a human is supposed to be, which is someone engaged with the world, engaged with his culture. And um, we also, though, want to recognize Solomon's supposed to be a spiritual being. He's supposed to be a pietist. And so we've, we've talked a little bit about his failures in that regard. He seems to be ignoring parts of Scripture and not digging in and engaging Scripture. And then we'll also talk about uh, doctrine and uh, the commitment to the covenant, what the covenant means and wh- what it means that these kings are wandering away from the covenant and faithfulness. We also see Solomon being very particular in the way he builds the temple, being very careful with that. Maybe that's a doctrinalist impulse to build something very precisely so that it reflects the perfection uh, of a holy God who gave them the, these sorts of instructions. So all these things I think are, I would say they're always underneath the surface for us. Um, even if we're not using these words, they really are part of uh, how we try to operate and what we care about week by week. All right. Well, if you've listened up to this point, thank you. This has been a longer than usual episode. Uh, just for fun here at the end, I'm going to give you a little special treat. Uh, Heather and Jason, of course, we try to be head, heart, and hands. Uh, but what do you feel like you are today and what do you feel like you usually are? Today, I would say I'm a doctrinalist. I would say I probably would tend to be that, although a transformationalist would definitely be part of that. Maybe the head part of transformation. Does that make sense? So a thinking transformationalist. There you go. There we go. All right. How about you, Jason? Today's a pietist day, except for this podcast. It was prayer day. I met with a staff member, prayed with them. I am going to someone's house to pray with them here shortly. So it's, I think it varies day in, day out. Some days are more pietistic. Some days are a little more transformationalist where you get to have a conversation with someone about uh, how they're using their talents in the arts to impact the world or how they're running their business in a Christian fashion. Those are very transformationalist uh, topics. So I think it just depends on the day. And for me, uh, preparing for this has made me a doctrinalist. I'm using my head a whole lot, and I certainly care about transformation, uh, but it may surprise some of our listeners and even the two people in the room with me that I tend to think of myself as a pietist. I'm very led by the gut. I do care a lot about experience and emotions and uh, genuine um, conversations, integrity of relationships and things like that. So I think that makes me more of a pietist, but I'm not exactly sure. All right. That does it for this time. Thanks for tuning in.